Citadel Society, Sentient Children, by Joel Armour, artist, author, and narrator. Chapter 1. The Uni Being a young leader of merely 15 years old, I had not realized where we had fallen short, why our previous leader gave in to the decadence of his ways. Why our very own son, Ivoli, ran off to the devil simply for more knowledge. Knowledge that defies God's existence. Finally, God has spoken to me. Finally, I can see the error of our ways. The light itself becomes brighter as the day draws near. God's day draws near. But which God? All this time, we wandered around in shadow, ignoring the first and the only original God, the very Father of our Father Yahweh, the very Creator of our Creator, the very void of space itself. Before there was the first ever illumination, the first ever star, I'm talking about Uni, the original God also known as Elohim, the actual void of space itself. Uni, brother to Kronos, a duality, two gods in one. Uni holds together all matter and all of space. He is the embodiment of dark matter. However, he was unable to express any emotion, unable to show any feeling, but yet feeling. He was only able to exist and his existence meant the holding together of the fabric of reality itself. His other half, his sibling, his brother Kronos, was simply just the very existence of time itself. Before long, Uni realized that no matter how long he existed, he and his brother would never be able to change, no matter what he did. Time was ongoing. It would never stop and his brother could never stop him, for he held together the particles of nothingness itself, dark matter. As the millennia wore on and thousands of years passed, both gods could not help but develop emotions of bitterness, jealousy, and anger towards each other. Where did this come from? How were they able to show these emotions when they had no means of expressing it? Their anger only developed worse and worse, and more and more. Their sibling rivalry exploded in the first natural phenomena, a huge star, the largest illumination of power yet to be seen again. This star potentially had an everlasting supply of energy. It was the embodiment of anger, Yahweh. Yahweh was literally a part of them. The only part of them that could show emotion, and it was pure anger, jealousy, and vengeance. He proved to be a god of war and judgment, who was admittedly selfish and jealous, and was partial to those who praised and worshipped him. He knew he had to find ways to appease his anger, otherwise it would mean going supernova and destroying himself. To this end, he created water, vapor, and gases. These elements could soothe him and form matter around him, that he could influence. He gave these elements a personality and would call them his son, Michael, Emmanuel, or Jesus, the combination of all gases and water vapor. Together with his explosive heat and power and Michael's malleable ability to combust, harden or liquefy when necessary, could form any source, any matter, and together they created planets and organic beings. Up until this point, we only knew about Yahweh and we fought many wars, bringing judgment upon the perceived wicked. But we did not know from whence we came. Uni, the one that unites all, the mathematical god, the physicist. The only way for us to succeed is for us to improve, for we are in a war of knowledge, a war by which we are vastly outnumbered, outmanned, forever only going to war. Now it's time for us to embrace the original God, the God of knowledge. 
we are now responsible for eating of the tree of knowledge. We have passed the test. It is time to eat. We must know all. That is the only way to destroy our enemy, an enemy of artificial knowledge. That is how we can eradicate the blasphemy that is our brother Ivoli, the very mind of Loki and Lucifer, that questioning, devious mind. It doubts God and nature itself, ignoring the laws of nature. The only way to stop that mind that worships rebellious knowledge and experimentation is to embrace its power. We will increase our numbers. I have now become this prophet, this light bearer of Uni and Yahweh and Allah and Odin and Jesus. As such, I stand as more than a man before you and I will guide you into the best forms of yourself. Our numbers have grown despite our wars in the past, yet we are still small in number. Many daughters have been born and are of little use. Hand them over to me. I am the new prophet and I will bring many other prophets into this world. I will raise our numbers and I will promote us from the apes we are now into the very image of Yahweh himself. This is the way of uni. This is the way of your new leader, the name I was given at birth, richness of God. Embrace the messenger of God, for this is the role I was born to play. May we seek greatness in God's image, and may we dominate this very earth. Chapter 2. Home. Hundreds of thousands of light years away, in a distant, unexplored portion of space, Ivoli and Lena embrace in the center of a damaged planet. The air was icy cold as it flowed through the planet, but abruptly heated as it hit the core. The ground beneath them was boiling hot lava, red and incinerating to the touch. They embrace with wings open and flapping, mid-air at the very center of where the cold icy air hits the hot steaming water vapor arising from the lava. They float amongst a sea of mist where the two temperatures meet. They find themselves in a huge crater formed by an asteroid which nearly split the planet in two. Ever since the events five years ago, Ivoli had made changes to the Citadel server. It had now gone completely organic in nature. The administrators had made the change to use dark matter as well as photons and light particles as energy. The mainframe of the server was now solely holographic and could form itself out of ions in the air. There was no longer a limit to speed or data. This was the new Citadel server, and it was everywhere at once. As Ivoli and Lena caress under the harshest of environments, they pin in their location to the server. A hexagonal transparent energy field formed around them. Hello, administrators. We're happy to announce a new planet, which could be habitable sometime in the near future. The atmosphere here is somewhat formed, yet only close to the core of the planet. Most of the exterior of the planet was destroyed by asteroids. Yet we should be able to terraform the interior layers of this planet between the core and the surface. Seem very rich. We found flowing water a few layers down that flows toward the crater only to evaporate from the heat. I think we could take a gamble here. Wonderful, Ivoli. We'll send you the schematics for assembling project restoration machines on site. Feel free to begin nanite reconstruction of mechanisms to prepare for assembly. Right away. Holographic blueprints emerged around Ivoli and Lena. They quickly selected various terror reforming schematics and began completing those three-dimensional holographic schematics with nanite machines. The nanites replicate to fill in the entire schematics of the machine. They then replicate by the millions, reforming over and over again, assembling themselves onto the rock-like crevices surrounding Ivoli and Lena, forming the structures in real time. The machines immediately began digging into the rock, laying down synthetic mulch, as well as disintegrating rock and gathering elements such as iron and other materials, creating a topsoil. To 
terror formation had begun. Ivoli and Lena face each other, staring into each other's eyes. Ivoli asks, E-203, do you miss it? Lena sighs, softly smiles and says, It was beautiful there. Say no more. Ivoline puts the coordinates for planet E-203. The couple upload their minds to the server, and millions of nanite machines take over their bodies, replicating at a blistering speed, overtaking all their cells. Photon particles assembled around the nanites, encompassing the entire structure of their bodies, creating a hologram with the exact image of the couple in three dimensions. Then everything was gone. Back on E-203, a hexagonal energy field assembled from photon particles in the air. A hologram of Ivoli and Lena appeared, and Nanite Assembly recreated their forms in synthetic and organic tissue. Ivoli and Lena's minds were uploaded into their new synthetically created bodies. They were home. Transparent skyways lined the skies, encircling the planet, which is four times the size of Earth. Humanoid and non-humanoid flying creatures soared the skies casually. It feels like forever, doesn't it? Ivoli asks. Lena smiled and slightly laughed. Contentment filled her eyes. They hover just above a cliff overlooking the ocean with a forest behind them. Come with me, Ivoli says as he pulls her towards him. She smiled and folded her wings. He held her close. They flew over the ocean. Lena let out a scream as she laughed. A slight boom was heard as they plunged into the ocean. Their eyes created a protective covering lens as they descended into the ocean. They began breathing through the shark-like gills they had beneath their chests, and their eyes began to light up as they reached deeper into the ocean. Suddenly, they noticed one light after another as the entire seabed began to light up, revealing an underwater translucent dome. The two made their way towards the dome as a hole opened up just in front of them. They entered the hole, which became a lighted tunnel and sucked them through to the other side. The dome stretched on for miles, revealing an underwater city. Sleeping pods surrounded them in vertical spiral formations that seemed to fill the expanse. Dozens of mermaids and mermen slowly swam by them, gently brushing by them with a light touch and a brief kiss as they swam by. Thousands of air bubbles rose from the center of the city. As they approached, they noticed the temperature was warm. It was an underwater hot spring. The two made their way into the rising bubbles and noticed that the bubbles were coming from a glowing red tunnel. They swam down into it, and the red tunnel slowly became wider until they emerged into a grafted room which felt very familiar to them. How? Lena began to ask as she was hit with a wave of emotion. Ivoli had meticulously recreated her secret room. Echoes of blue and green came and went against the grafted out red walls of the lodging. A circle was cut out of the floor where lava seemed to glow a bit lower down. Out of it spiraled hot champagne bubbles. A hologram played across the ceiling where they stood looking up at what appeared to be galaxies while to their sides they could see multiple small screens surrounding them with the ocean in clear display. Ivoli began to ask Lena if she liked his recreation of her digital hideaway, but was immediately quieted by Lena's reaffirming grip of her hand that was placed on his arm. She whispered in a low tone, It's perfect. Chapter 3 Richness Administration Ten years had passed since Richie, also known as Richness of God, implemented his new regime under a new god, Uni. Every human now had a terminum implanted into their brain. 
many had begun arming themselves, creating weapons, and designing their own protective machinery. Their numbers had increased from 200,000 to 2 million over the 10-year span, either through cloning or childbirth. 2,000 of those children, richness personally fathered, ranging from age 6 to 8 years old. 1,800 of those were female. Upon birth, richness made sure to implant terminals into his infant's brains so that they could have immediate access to the Citadel servers, which violated the previous law that one could only implant a terminal at 18 years of age. Thus, he created advanced weapons of war. They feared no one and were extremely brilliant. However, our cost of implanting terminals upon infants was extreme introversion and lack of empathy. They were loners, preferring to endlessly learn and download data than to even talk. Every question they could have possibly wanted to ask was instantly answered for them by thought. Richness himself realized that the only reason he had a hold on them was that he fed them and could provide them with any request they had. They communicated through online messaging. As things had evolved, Richness found himself busy around the clock, making sure that each one of the 2,000 genius children were instantly appeased. He knew that if he did not act immediately, they would kill him without hesitation. He expected this and was ready for them. Richie spent most of his time inside of his personal militarized bunker, and when he had to leave, he did so in a large, highly mobile, multifunctional tank, which doubled for his defensive living quarters. Giving everyone terminals did not have the effect he had hoped for, but he could not admit that he was wrong. Everyone was now a threat. To make himself remain in power, he blocked access to many vital materials, especially those used to make weapons. Everything was rationed. Even so, he was restless. He was tirelessly wary of anyone who tried to get close to him. The irony was, no matter what invitation he sent to his own children, they did not care to be around him. He conducted citywide rallies from the privacy of his bunker to keep citizens dedicated to the cause of killing for God. While in the years past, every citizen assembled for these rallies, now he was lucky if a quarter of the citizens assembled. It turned out that the only citizens who were still somewhat vigilant about their hate for synthetic humans were those over 30 years old. Richie was losing his grip with the youth of his kingdom, and the only way he could think of regaining it was cutting off their technology. He had to regain his control. An announcement went out to all citizens. Our third worship for the week will be held in exactly three hours. Your attendance is mandatory. Two days ago, the attendance was at an all-time low. Only 6,000 showed up. Many who even bothered to fill out partial sections of the after-worship survey mentioned that they found three times a week excessive, especially with the first two nights being back-to-back. -back. Granted, Richie's children themselves never showed up and never cared to say why either. They just simply ignored it. Eager to keep their loyalty, he chose to turn a blind eye to their grievances and never enforced any rules upon them. As usual, an announcement was made three hours before the third weekly worship session. This time, people were asked to confirm whether or not they were going to attend. Barely 4,000 people responded. I've had it, Richie shouted as he sent out large armored vehicles throughout the city. These vehicles emitted a loud sound, which was a hypersonic frequency jammer, frying and short-circuiting all communication devices within 400 yards. The crowd was in an uproar. Every citizen under the age of 30 took to the streets 
rioting in anger. The signal had worked only too well, severing each citizen's connection to the server. Citizens, I repeat, this was only a test gone wrong. You'd be pleased to know internet access will be provided to all at the next sanctioned worship session. Thank you for your cooperation, and may the joint gods bless you. Screw the joint gods! Citizens yelled after the patronizing message aired. Richie was pleased. As far as he was concerned, he had stockpiled more ammo than anyone else and was hiding advanced weaponry solicited from his children. Heh <laughs> I win. Richness of God thought to himself. An RPG rocket blasted into the side of a broadcast tank. Ha! I expected as much, but they are dependent on me. They will fall in line, Richness thought. A jingle ran out across the city, followed by an announcement. We understand there might have been an accident in the city. Casualties are few. Everything is handled. We've also decided to extend worship hours from two hours three times a week to four hours three times a week in order to handle more internet time. Thank you for your understanding. Richness administration. Shouts of hate echoed across the city as citizens rioted once again. Chapter 4. Progression Back on planet E-203, a new generation emerged. The once quiet planet now echoed with laughs and screams of children running wild. Once they were old enough to get around on their own, they were off in droves. Flocks of winged young humanoids soared the air. Packs of them roamed the mountains and flatlands, and schools of young mermaids and mermen darted across the ocean. They roamed and played with animals, explored caves and jungles, and spoke to orbital infospheres until they fell asleep. It was agreed that the population would follow proper protocol by not implanting servers into children until they had the right to choose so at age 18. However, there were exceptions that were also in the original law, such as terminal illness. From time to time, Ivoli would swoop in on a group of children and they would surround him, engulfing him with questions. Few of them became fascinated with biology, physiology, and engineering or applied sciences after picking his brain on issues. Many vowed to become administrators like him one day. The vast majority, however, were just the most happy and carefree creatures. What would our child be like? Ivoli wondered. But he also felt that like they were all his children. Ivoli and Lena spent much of their time assessing energy and geothermal conditions on planets. Ivoli pioneered a way to visually track energy patterns. This was a celebrated achievement on Ivoli's part. But it was just the beginning. The next step for Ivoli was seeing if he could exist completely within those spectrums. On Earth, it was now the second week of internet control and regulation within the administration. This time, people were lined up all day waiting for the internet screens to show up. A jingle rang out. It pleases the administration to see its citizens waiting for our worship hours. Your benevolent host has seen to it to start worship early today to accommodate your internet needs. So after the first 70 minutes of worship, we will begin bringing out the internet screens, which will be available for an extra four hours today. That means a total of eight hours of worship today. If all goes well, the administration is willing to repeat this process tomorrow for the second of our three-day weekly worship sessions. Screw you, citizens shouted as they hurled other insults towards the telescreens. 
Thank you for your understanding, and thank you for supporting the Richness of God administration. Next began the diction of the amended Genesis account from the first three chapters of the Bible. By the 70th minute, the tanks rolled up, bringing the internet screens with them. As the first tank drove in, boom, an explosion was heard and the tank was blown over onto its side. The crowds yelled, down with the administration, as they ran up, throwing Molotov cocktails at the downed tank. The other tanks froze, stopping dead in their tracks. It was apparent that landmines were planted and the drivers could not be certain of the location. It was a full on revolt. People rioted and threw bricks and fired guns at the administration. Make sure they know that the internet is still available to them. Ordered richness. An audio went out. Please be assured that the internet terminals are still available to you. Calmly approach each tank and you may use said terminal at no cost to you. A low whistle dragged through the air getting louder by the second. Then a huge boom was heard. An RPG missile blew up the right side of the audio tower speakers. Fry it! Fry it all! Richness said, grimacing, clenching his jaws. He smashed the signal jammer over and over again, faster and faster, until he actually stood up and smashed both fists on his control panel, yelling at the top of his lungs. Did you hear me? Fry the system! Nobody gets anything anymore. I'll teach them to be grateful. There was no answer. What the heck is wrong with this bunker? Hello? Can you hear me? First line. Can you read me? Children? No answer was reported. Ha. Huh. I'll just log on to Citadel and contact the kids there. Richness thought, but he couldn't. He was unable to even use his implanted chip. Apparently, he fried all communication in the city, including his own. His own brain terminal was also fried. Come on, this is ridiculous. I'll just get into my tank. That should work. The minute he cracked open a hangar shaft... He heard several loud whistles. The blast sent him flying back 60 meters. His ears rung. His vision blurred. He tried to crawl his way to the hangar doors to close them again. He clutched onto the floor as a blast went off. Abruptly, he began crawling the other way. He hit a remote switch, which lowered a hatch down to the floor. He crawled inside of it and strapped himself into a seat on the hatch. The hatch was then brought back up into a control room. He grabbed onto a lever on his left and a lever on his right and moved them one at a time. He began to move. He hit the interface screen in front of him and the control panel lit up. A light beamed out from the center of the structure and then auxiliary lights all lit up to display a limbed mechanical structure. He was strapped into his own four-limbed mobile defense unit. Come and get me, you ungrateful brats, he muttered under his breath. Chapter 5. Culminated Results Ifly reported in. I've been able to create an emitter that shoots out a frequency in a 10 meter radius, which only picks up thermal data, including the gamma and beta fields. Within these fields, I can observe thermal data, including units of heat, ions, and photons being secreted into the atmosphere. I view this as a small success because not only can we view energy expenditure real time, but also potential energy. I can actually zoom in and view masses of energy within the mitochondrias of organisms around me 
within the frequency shroud. I can also view stores of ATP in cells themselves, but most importantly, the entire Krebs cycle is visible, or I should say I can view the energy from the metabolism converting energy within us, also within leaves of plants. What I'm trying to say is even though we know we release energy and gain energy through different pathways, visually it looks like we are cycling it through and around us. It's almost like we are all sharing. Thank you for your research, Ivoli. We have been using photons and ions for energy. We will note this as an alternate source. Back on Earth, richness of God, laid in wait, in complete darkness, in an underground warehouse under his bunker. He scoffed inside of his mechanized defense unit. If they're gonna take me down, they're gonna have to try to dig me out of this bunker. He scoffed and laughed. A part of him was completely thrilled with the notion of slaughtering his citizens. He had stockpiled large crates of weapons around him and was willing to use them all. One after another, he heard massive explosions going off against his bunker as he sat in the dark. Then he heard a screeching and crunching sound and then a loud crack. It seemed that his kids figured out a way to get through his hangar security shaft. A combination of explosions and some sort of mechanical device or devices must have been used to pull and break the shaft off of its track. Okay, any minute now. Suddenly, a boom was heard. Then three minutes went by. Boom! This time even louder. The iron shaft door to the underground warehouse was now bent in, and the point of impact was extremely pushed and distorted. Everything was silent for five minutes. Hmm. They gave up, huh? Haha. <laughs> They're only children anyway. No attention span. That's what happens when you feed them knowledge instantaneously into their brains from birth. Pathetic. Well, I win anyway. I need to find a way to get to a portal. If I can just get to a portal, maybe even to Ivoli's planet. <laughs> yes, perfect. I'll go to that planet he's on, E-203. I'll kill him and I'll just take it over. Huh. <laughs> It's just a planet of lame, synthetic hippies. I'll be a king. A king of a larger kingdom. Okay, so that's settled. How do I get out of here first? Maybe I need to sneak out on foot. Maybe a disguise. The shaft door to the warehouse went flying in. Completely folded and distorted. Crashing into the wall of the warehouse. 50 feet above him. What the heck? Debris rained down on him, and concrete dust created whirls of thick smog, making visibility impossible. What the heck is that? There was something protruding over the metal walkway above him. A huge shell went exploding through the metal crates to his right and slammed into the wall, shaking the entire structure. That thing he saw protruding was the cannon gun of his very own tank that was sitting outside of his hangar. My tank? Who could possibly get my tank to work? It only responds to my bioscans. I have to get into that tank to stop it. Suddenly, he was deafened by the shouts and screams of thousands of people. Gunshots were fired at him. Missiles sounded off. It was absolute mayhem. Get out. Leave now or you will all die. The crowd shouted. Die, you manipulating scum. The crowd was at an absolute frenzy. He fired up his defensive mechanized unit. The lights blared, blinding many of the naysayers in the crowd. Suddenly, 
Everyone grew quiet. His two shoulder guns made a slight hum, and then he began shooting through the crowd and stepping over corpses, making his way towards his tank. When I get in there, I'm going to personally kill that brat inside my tank. He quickly climbed out of his defensive unit and jumped into the tank cabin amidst thousands of bullets whizzing by him. Pack, pack. He was shot just as he landed inside of the tank. Damn it. He was shot twice in the right side of his stomach. Oh, he grimaced as he slowly tried to reach into his cockpit. It was empty. How in the... His children had complete control of his tank without even leaving their positions. They had completely bombarded his system with errors to where it was paralyzed. Then they wrote their own program and installed it to reset the tank and run it. He screamed, those damn kids, and went shooting and bashing all the control screens. He had to shut the system off by whatever means necessary and switch to manual operation controls. He literally had to drive this tank with no help from his control panel. He turned his cockpit and cannon arm to the opposite direction and pulled at the lever at his right and the engine revved forward slowly. I'm going to personally kill those kids one by one. I want to watch the life slip out of their eyes by my hand. The thought of killing his children made him grin slowly, only on the right side of his mouth. Killing his estranged children now seemed like a sweet fantasy to him. Ivoli and Lena vacationed on an icy asteroid out in space. I'm not sure if we should be teleporting, since our new method requires uploading to the server and material destabilization and nanite molecular reassembly. We just don't have the data since we haven't tried it yet on an unborn fetus. Ivoli smirked. Yeah, right here isn't so bad. Lena smirked back at Ivoli as she sat with his head on her right shoulder. We can still split the pregnancy as we've planned. The latter three quarters in our in vitro hub. I can assemble one as needed. I have the specifications all noted down on the server. Mm-hmm, I know you do, Lena said, turning to face his face, eye to eye in a sharky, yet playfully sarcastic tone. She stared him in the eyes and challenged him with a snarl, wrinkling her nose. He quickly stole a kiss and watched her lips change into a slight smile. As he looked closely into her eyes, he could see the brim of a cloudy atmosphere of a planet just behind the huge broken asteroid they were on, as they seemed to spiral that planet in a field of floating rocks, they establish a temporary atmosphere with a 20 meter radius of breathable air as they study the rock, which was part ice, but had lava at its core. Living dangerously was an understatement for Ivoli and Lena, as they hilariously would put themselves in the harshest environments. Pranking became their guilty obsession as they found romantic getaways. Chapter 6. Resolution Richness arrived at the nearest tower where a quarter of his children were housed. Strangely, it was left open. He patched himself up and completely climbed out of his tank. The lobby was unoccupied. No one was there. Hmm, of course. If the internet was fried, then why would they stay in their dorms? Huh. Anyway, what's the point of wasting my time killing each child? I'm an idiot. It'd take me hours to kill them by hand. Silly me. Let me get out of here and head to that portal. I can still kill my brother if I make it in one piece.
Ha! Huh. The smell of new beginnings. Richness of God made his way over to the closest geothermal plant and got into a transportation hub heading for the lobby of the nearest Citadel server. From the main lobby, he inquired on the location of a wormhole transport to planet E-203. The hub escorted him out of the building onto an elevated platform. Ah, oh, what the? He looked down and noticed that he was shot, once in the right bicep and once in the right side of his ribcage. He looked up and saw thousands of children surrounding the platform. Kids? It's me, your dad. This time, he was shot twice in the right thigh. Ah, stop. Okay, stop. I get it. I get it. It's okay. I'm sorry. I'll get you all back online as soon as I can. As soon as I get back from my little trip, okay? This time, he was shot in his left shoulder. Ah, oh, okay. Okay, please, listen. I didn't know your mother's. I'm sorry. Listen, listen to me. I'm a king. This is how it goes. I had all the women stripped and brought to me against their will. Hey, listen. You guys are the children of a king. It doesn't matter what dumb 13-year-old had you. This time, he was shot in the right hip, which dropped him to his right knee. Ah! Wait, 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 wait. Okay, okay, I get it. I messed up, guys. What is it? What do you want? Just tell me. Why can't you talk? I don't... Hey, server, can you help me here? Citadel does not get involved with human affairs. Our purpose is merely to record and sustain habitation and continuation of all species. Right, you don't know crap. Get these kids back online, would you? These children have always been connected to Citadel. Their transcript starts from one minute after birth. How? How did they survive the jammers? I mean, I fried all the brain terminals. Apparently, one child uploaded herself to the server at age two, leaving her body behind in order to find ways to innovate from within our server to protect her siblings. What? One of you died? To protect the others at age two? What is this? This is preposterous. And why aren't they speaking? They've been speaking to me in programming code since birth. Richness knelt there on his knees at the mercy of his estranged children. He looked around slowly at each one of them. Huh. Joke's on me, huh? huh? You guys win. So just let me through and you'll never see me again. One bullet caught him in the left knee and the other clipped his right lung. Ah! Richness screamed in pain, falling flat on his face and gasping for air. His body shook violently. No! His left arm painfully reached out and tried to lift his body up, slightly, so that he could move his head to look up. No, 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 no. He swallowed back down a cough. He refused to die. One by one, the children stepped away from the portal, watching him attempt to drag his body towards it. He gingerly craned his neck forward and tried to get his head into the portal. Suddenly, his forehead dropped into it, and in an instant, his body was sucked into the portal. Richness of God opened his eyes, coughed up blood, and looked ahead at the silhouette of a young boy of maybe four years old, with wings curiously raised, staring at him. He laid face down and shot his arm out toward the boy, hand outstretched. He grimaced, Ivily. The boy just stood there looking at him. Get, get Ivily. He reached out to grab the boy, but the boy stepped back and moved his arm away. Suddenly, Ivoli reached down and grabbed Richness by the right trapezius muscle and pulled him up into a seated position. Brother, 
I, richness, coughed up blood to clear his throat. I, I hated you. I know, Rich. No, no, I, I hated you because I loved you. Richness desperately tried to say, I know, I forgive you. You didn't care. You, you did what you wanted to. You questioned father. How were you not killed? It's like everyone liked you, but you didn't even care. Richie, I... No, I was a child and you left me. You left me there in that war camp, that religious war camp. To do what? To go wander the stars? And I'm supposed to be happy. Would you come back to show off? Richness of God choked on some more blood and coughed violently. <laughs> what chance could I have? I was a kid. I couldn't do anything. Rich, I had to think for myself. Ivoli replied. You, you could have killed him. You could have killed dad and saved all of us. Richness of God gasped and tried to breathe. Selfish. Richness of God died. Ivelisse's left arm was under Richness's right arm, holding him up. Ivoli just knelt there, motionless, with his head looking down. We could have him disassembled molecularly and reappropriate his minerals for terror formation, said the boy. Ivoli remained motionless. Dad? Dad? The boy inquired. Ivoli burst out into heavy sobs. Soon, his tears became uncontrollable. Dad, why? Ivoli responded. You're... You're right, son. We'll... We'll re... Ivoli's sobbing interrupted his attempt to speak. Soon, he just remained motionless, looking down. His son came over and hugged his back. Then he rested his head on his father's back. Ivoli began feeling warm liquid between his boy's face and his back. Ivoli turned around and grabbed his son under the armpits, staring into his face. The boy's face flinched. His mouth quivered and squirmed. His eyes squinted and watered as he held back tears. Uni? Ivoli inquired. Uni? Ivoli inquired. Dad? The boy sobbingly replied. Ivoli pulled the boy into his chest and embraced him. Ivoli quietly stated, He was my little brother. Thank you for listening, and please stay tuned for the next book in the series, Citadel Society. The Manufactured Organic.